Okay, I'm ready. Um, Makoto? Yes, what is this document? Um, I look like in my outfit. What's that? It's Tante Opera Milky Holmes, um, I shall like shilling for a costume. It looks good on you. You look cute. Yeah, let me take a picture. Okay. With your, with my Pixel 3A. Okay. I'll put it on camera. Hey, you don't have to smile if you don't want to. Oh, okay. I look embarrassed in that costume. I know. Just don't smile. There we go. Alright. Let's just, let's just turn off. Let's just go back. And just go back. And then, here we go. Okay, I'm going to class now. Would you, like to, would you like to come with me? Uh, yes. Okay. Alright then, Shokima. Let's go inside my classroom. And we'll go have to, we'll have to, uh, go. For, uh, for, um, tomorrow's birthday. Yeah, I'm kind of looking embarrassed in a costume. I know that. But it's okay if you wear, um, Tante Opera Mickey Holmes, uh, costume. Yeah. Okay, anyway. Let's just do it. What? What the hell is costume? Shh! Quiet, please! Hello, class. Welcome to this week's filmmaking lesson. In this sponsor video, it was like Aladdin TV commercial over VHS capture or 2019 TV spot. You can choose, and there will be added to Winnie the Pooh making friends. Let's get on to home video releases first. So first, yes I said it. On today we will be doing Godzilla. King of the Monsters 1956 film. Here is the plot in this film. American reporter Steve Martin, Raymond Burr, is brought from the ruins of Tokyo to a hospital filled with maimed and wounded citizens. Emiko, Momoko Kochi, discovers him among the victims and attempts to find a doctor for him. Martin recalls in flashback stopping over in Tokyo, where a series of inexplicable ship disasters catches his attention. When a sole survivor washes up on Odo Island, Martin flies there for the story, along with Demo Iwanaga, Frank Iwanaga, a representative of the Japanese Security Defense Forces, JSDF. He learns of the island inhabitants' long-held belief in a sea monster god known to them as Godzilla, which they believe is causing the disasters. That night, a heavy rain and wind storm strikes the island, destroying many houses and killing some villagers. The locals believe that Godzilla and not the storm are responsible for the destruction. Martin returns to the devastated island with Dr. Yumane, Takashi Shimura, who is leading a team to investigate the ruins of Odo Island. Huge radioactive footprints and a prehistoric trilobite are discovered. An alarm rings and Martin, the villagers, and Dr. Yumane's team head up a hill for safety. Near the summit, they see Godzilla's head and upper torso looking down upon them and they quickly flee downhill. Dr. Yumane later returns to Tokyo to present his findings, Godzilla was resurrected by repeated nuclear tests in the Pacific. The military responds by attempting to kill a giant creature with depth charges, much to Yumane's dismay. Martin contacts his old friend, Dr. Dei Aizuk Sarazawa, Akihiko Hirata, for dinner, but Sarazawa declines due to planned commitments with his fiancée. Emiko Dr. Yumane's daughter, goes over to Sarazawa's home to break off her arranged engagement to him. She is actually in love with Hideo Ogata, Akira Takarada, a salvage ship captain. Dr. Sarazawa, however, gives her a demonstration of his secret project, which horrifies her. She is sworn to secrecy and unable to bring herself to break off the engagement. Godzilla surfaces from Tokyo Bay, unharmed by the depth charges, and attacks the city. The next morning, to repel Godzilla, the JSDF arranges for a modification to the tall electrical towers along the Tokyo coast. The King of the Monsters resurfaces that night and easily breaks through the electrical tower fences and JSDF tank defense line by using his atomic heat breath. With his tape recorder, Martin documents Godzilla's annihilation of the city and is nearly killed during the attack. Godzilla returns to the sea leaving Tokyo a burning destroyed ruin. Here, the flashback ends, and Martin wakes up in the hospital with Amigo and Ogata. Horrified by the destruction, 
Emiko reveals to Martin and Ogata the existence of Dr. Sarazawa's oxygen destroyer, which disintegrates oxygen atoms in salt water and causes all marine organisms to die of acidic asphyxiation. Emiko and Ogata go to Dr. Sarazawa to convince him to use the oxygen destroyer on Godzilla, but he initially refuses. After watching a television broadcast showing the nation's plight, Dr. Sarazawa finally gives in to their pleas. A Navy ship takes Ogata and Sarazawa out to the deepest part of Tokyo Bay to plant the underwater weapon. Wearing deep sea diving gear, Ogata and Dr. Sarazawa are lowered by lifelines down to the bottom, near the sleeping Godzilla. After they move into position, Ogata signals the surface and is pulled up, but Sarazawa delays his ascent and suddenly activates the device. He radios the surface to tell them that it is working after which he removes his knife and cuts his diving helmet's oxygen supply line and tether rope, taking the secret of his oxygen destroyer to the grave. The mission succeeds in obliterating Godzilla. Aboard ship, all mourn the unexpected loss of Dr. Serizawa. In this solemn moment, Martin makes a final observation, the menace was gone dot 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 so is a great man. But the whole world could wake up and live again. All right. On tomorrow. We will be doing Godzilla vs. Monster Zero 1965 film. Here is the plot in this film. In the year 196X, 4, two astronauts, Fuji and Glenn, are sent to investigate the surface of the mysterious planet X. There they encounter advanced and seemingly benevolent human-like beings called the Zillions and their leader the Controller. The aliens usher the astronauts into their underground base and moments later the surface is attacked by a creature the Zillions call Monster Zero, but which the astronauts recognize as King Ghidorah, a planet-destroying monster that had attacked Earth once before. The monster eventually leaves, but the controller states that Ghidorah has been attacking repeatedly, forcing them to live underground in constant fear. He requests to boil the Earth monsters Godzilla and Rodan to act as sentries against Ghidorah's attacks, in return for the cure for cancer. The English dub says the formula can cure any disease. The astronauts return to Earth and deliver the message. Meanwhile, an inventor named Tetsuo has designed a personal alarm that emits an ear-splitting electric siren. He sells it to a businesswoman named Nami Kawa, but she disappears before paying him. Tetsuo is romantically involved with Fuji's sister, Haruno, but Fuji disapproves and berates him for getting scammed. Tetsuo sees Nami Kawa with Glenn and later follows her, but he is captured and imprisoned by Zillion spies. Glenn and Fuji begin to worry that the Zillions may have ulterior motives. Their suspicions appear confirmed when three Zillion spacecraft appear in Japan. The controller apologizes for coming to Earth without permission. The Zillions locate Godzilla and Rodan, both sleeping, and use their technology to transport them to Planet X. They also bring Glenn, Fuji and the scientist Sakurai with them. After a brief confrontation, the Earth monsters succeed in driving Ghidorah away. Glenn and Fuji sneak away during the battle and encounter two Zillion women, both of whom look identical to Nami Kawa. Zillion guards confront the astronauts and bring them back to the controller, who reprimands but does not punish them. The astronauts are given a tape with instructions for the miracle cure and sent home, leaving Godzilla and Rodan behind. The tape is played for the world's leaders, but instead it contains an ultimatum demanding that they surrender Earth to the Zillions or be destroyed by Godzilla, Rodan, and Ghidorah, who are under the aliens' control. Glenn storms into Nami Kawa's office and finds her in Zillion garb. She admits that she is one of their spies, but confesses that she has fallen in love with him. Her commander arrives to arrest Glenn and executes Nami Kawa for letting emotion cloud her judgment but not before she slips a note into Glenn's pocket. Glenn is taken to the same cell as Tetsuo. They read Nami Kawa's note, which explains that the sound from Tetsuo's invention disrupts the zillion's electronics. Tetsuo has a prototype with him, which he activates, weakening their captors and allowing them to escape. Sakurai and Fuji build a device to disrupt the zillion's control over the monsters. Glenn and Tetsuo arrive to share the zillion's weakness. As the monsters attack, Sakurai's device is activated and the sound from Tetsuo's alarm is broadcast over the radio. The invasion is thwarted and the Zillions, 
unable to fight back or retreat, destroy themselves en masse. The monsters awaken from their trance and the fight ensues. All three topple off a cliff, Ghidorah flies away, while those watching speculate that Godzilla and Draden are probably still alive. Fuji acknowledges Tetsuo's important role in the victory and no longer thinks poorly of him. Sakurai states that he wants to send Glenn and Fuji back to Planet X to study the planet thoroughly, the English dub says they are to be ambassadors. The astronauts are reluctant, but make the best of the moment, happy that the Earth is safe. Alright. On Thursday, we will be doing Godzilla vs. The Thing 1964 film. Here is the plot in this film. News reporter Ichiro Sakai and photographer Junko Nakanishi take pictures of wreckage caused by a typhoon. They uncover a strange, bluish-gray object in the debris, not knowing its significance. Later that day, a giant egg is discovered on the shore. The local villagers salvage it and an entrepreneur of Happy Enterprises, named Kumiyama, buys the egg from the local villagers. Instead of letting scientists study the egg, Kumiyama wants to make it into a large tourist attraction. Sakai and Nakanishi are informed that the strange object they found is extremely radioactive. While Sakai, Nakanishi, and Professor Miura are discussing the egg in a hotel, they discover Kumiyama checking in. Kumiyama meets with Jiro Torihata, the head of Happy Enterprises. They are unexpectedly confronted by tiny twin girls known as the Shobaijin and try to capture them. The Shobaijin escape and meet with Sakai, Nakanishi, and Professor Miura. They explain that the egg belongs to Mothra. If the egg hatches, the larva, though they have no quarrel with humans, will still cause great damage looking for food. The trio agrees to help. Sakai, Nakanishi and Miura try to reason with Kumiyama and Torahata but fail to do so and the Shobaijin leave. The three of them return to Karata Beach to determine if there is any more radioactive contamination, and, knowing it cannot be Mothra, try to find what the source might be. They soon find it, Godzilla, who had been washed up onto Karata Beach and buried under mud by the hurricane, suddenly emerges and begins to attack Nagoya. Sakai, Junko, and Miura travel to Infant Island to request the Shobaijin to send Mothra to defeat Godzilla. The natives of the island and the Shobaijin are eventually convinced by the trio. However, the Shobaijin warn them that Mothra is already near death by natural causes. Kumiyama barges into Torahata's room and demands to get his money back that Torahata had recently swindled from him. Kumiyama is shot by Torahata, then he too is killed when Godzilla arrives and destroys his hotel. Mothra arrives just when Godzilla reaches her egg and engages Godzilla in battle. Briefly, she seems to be winning, even spraying Godzilla with a poisonous powder, though this is ineffective. Despite giving her all, Godzilla hits her with its atomic breath, and Mothra collapses and dies from exhaustion. Fortunately, Godzilla loses interest in the egg and proceeds with its rampage. The JSDF launches multiple campaigns against Godzilla until two giant larvae hatch from Mothra's egg. They follow Godzilla to Iwa Island trap it with her silk spray and force Godzilla into the sea. Sakai, Junko, and Miura thank the Mothra larvae and Shobaijin as they return to Infant Island. Alright. On Friday, we will be doing Godzilla's Revenge 1969 film. Here is the plot in this film. Ishiro Miki, to Minori Yazaki, is a highly imaginative but lonely latchkey kid growing up in urban, and at that time, polluted, Kawasaki. Every day he comes home to his family's empty apartment. His only friends are a toymaker named Shinpei Inami, Aisai Yamamoto, and a young girl named Sachiko, Hidemi Ito. Every day after school, Ichiro is tormented by a gang of bullies led by a child named Sanko Gabara, Junaki Ito. To escape his loneliness, Ichiro sleeps and dreams about visiting Monster Island. During his visit, he witnesses Godzilla battle three Kamakuras and Ebaira, a giant sea monster. Ichiro is then chased by rogue Kamakuras and falls into a deep cave, but luckily avoids being caught by Kamakuras. Shortly afterward, Ichiro is rescued from the cave by Manila. Ichiro quickly learns that Manila has bully problems too, as it is bullied by a monstrous ogre known as Gabara. 
Ichiro is then awoken by Shinpei who informs him that his mother must work late again. Ichiro goes out to play, but is then frightened by the bullies and finds and explores an abandoned factory. After finding some souvenirs, tubes, a headset, and a wallet with someone's license, Ichiro leaves the factory after hearing some sirens close by. After Ichiro leaves, two bank robbers, played by Siko Sakai and Kazuo Suzuki, who were hiding out in the factory learn that Ichiro has found one of their driver's licenses and follow him in order to kidnap him. Later, after his sukiyaki dinner with Shinpei, Ichiro dreams again and reunites with Manila. Together they both watch as Godzilla fights Abaira, Kumunga, and some invading jets. Then in the middle of Godzilla's fights, Gabra appears and Manila is forced to battle it, and after a short and one-sided battle, Manila runs away in fear. Godzilla returns to train Manila how to fight and use its own atomic ray. However, Ichiro is woken up this time by the bank robbers and is taken hostage as a means of protection from the authorities. Out of fear and being watched by the thieves, Ichiro calls for Manila's help and falls asleep again where he witnesses Manila being beaten up by Gabara again. Finally, Ichiro helps Manila fight back at Gabara and eventually, Manila wins, catapulting the bully through the air by a seesaw-like log. Godzilla, who was in the area watching comes to congratulate Manila for its victory but is ambushed by a vengeful Gabara. Godzilla easily beats down Gabara and sends the bully into retreat, never to bother Manila again. Now from his experiences in his dreams, Ishir learns how to face his fears and fight back, gaining the courage to outwit the thieves just in time for the police, called by Shinpei, to arrive and arrest them. The next day, Ichiro stands up to Senko and his gang and wins, regaining his pride and confidence in the process. He also gains their friendship when he plays a prank on a billboard painter. Alright. Also on Friday, we will be doing King Kong vs. Godzilla 1962 film. Here is the plot in this film. Mr. Taco, head of Pacific Pharmaceuticals, is frustrated with the television shows his company is sponsoring and wants something to boost his ratings. When a doctor tells Taco about a giant monster he discovered on the small Faroe Island, Taco believes that it would be a brilliant idea to use the monster to gain publicity. Taco immediately sends two men, Sakurai and Kensaburo, to find and bring back the monster. Meanwhile, the American submarine Seahawk gets caught in an iceberg. The iceberg collapses, unleashing Godzilla, who, in the Japanese version, had been trapped with them since 1955, who then destroys the submarine and a nearby Arctic military base. On Faroe Island, a giant octopus attacks the native village. The mysterious pharaoh monster, revealed to be King Kong, arrives and defeats the octopus. Khan then drinks some red berry juice that immediately puts him to sleep. Sakurai and Kensaburo place Kong on a large raft and begin to transport him back to Japan. Mr. Taco arrives on the ship transporting Kong, but a JSDF ship stops them and orders them to return Kong to Faroe Island. Meanwhile, Godzilla arrives in Japan and begins terrorizing the countryside. Kong wakes up and breaks free from the raft. Reaching the mainland, Kong confronts Godzilla and proceeds to throw giant rocks at Godzilla. Godzilla is not faced by King Kong's rock attack and uses its atomic breath to burn him. Kong retreats after realizing that he is not yet ready to take on Godzilla and its atomic breath. The JSDF digs a large pit laden with explosives and poison gas and lures Godzilla into it, but Godzilla is unharmed. They next string up a barrier of power lines around the city filled with 1 million volts of electricity. 50,000 volts were tried in the first film, but failed to turn the monster back, which proved effective against Godzilla. Kong then approaches Tokyo and tears through the power lines, feeding off the electricity which seems to make him stronger. Kong then enters Tokyo and captures Fumiko, Sakurai's sister. The JSDF launches capsules full of the Faroe Island berry juice in gas form which puts Kong to sleep and are able to rescue Fumiko. The JSDF then decides to transport Kong via balloons to Godzilla, in hopes that they will kill each other. The next morning, Kong is dropped next to Godzilla at the summit of Mount Fuji and the two engage in a final battle. 
Godzilla initially has the advantage due to its atomic breath and nearly kills Kong. After knocking Kong out with a devastating dropkick until smacks to the head, Godzilla begins burning the foliage around Kong trying to cremate him. Suddenly a bolt of lightning from thunder clouds strike King Kong reviving him and charging him up. The monsters continue their fight with the revitalized King Kong beating up Godzilla. Kong continues to throw rocks to attack Godzilla as Godzilla uses its atomic breath to keep Kong at a distance. The two monsters destroy Atomi Castle and both fall off a cliff together into the Pacific Ocean. After an underwater battle, only Kong resurfaces. Kong begins to swim towards his island home. There is no sign of Godzilla, but the JSDF speculates that it is possible that it survived. Alright. Also on Friday, we will be doing Terror of Mechagodzilla 1975 film. Here is the plot in this film. Continuing after the end of the events of Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, Interpol agents, led by Inspector Kuzaka, search for the pieces of Mechagodzilla at the bottom of the Okinawan Sea. Using the submarine, Akatsuki, they hope to gather information on the robot's builders, the alien simions. The Akatsuki is suddenly attacked by a giant aquatic dinosaur called Titanosaurus and the crew vanishes. Interpol starts an investigation into the incident. With the help of marine biologist Akira Ikenos, they trace Titanosaurus to a reclusive, mad scientist named Shinzo Mafune, who wants to destroy all mankind. While Ikenos is visiting his old home in the seaside forest of Manazuru, they meet Mafune's lone daughter, Katsura. She tells them that not only is her father dead, but she burned all of the notes about the giant dinosaur, at her father's request. Unknowns to them, Mafune is still alive and well. He is visited by his friend Suda, who is an aide to the alien leader Miguel. He is leading the project to quickly rebuild Mechagodzilla. Miguel offers their services to Mafune, so that his Titanosaurus and their Mechagodzilla too will be the ultimate weapons. They hope to wipe out mankind and rebuild the world for themselves, starting with Tokyo and branching out from there. But things are complicated for both factions when Ikenos falls in love with Gatsura and unwittingly gives her Interpol's information against Titanosaurus, the new Mecha Godzilla and the aliens. It is also discovered that Katsura is actually a cyborg, due to undergoing surgery, and Miguel still has uses for her. Meanwhile, Mifune is desperate to unleash Titanosaurus without the aliens' permission, so he releases it on Yuakasuka one night. By then, Interpol discovers that supersonic waves are tightness or sweetness. They have a supersonic wave oscillator ready, but Godzilla sabotages the machine before they can use it. Fortunately, Godzilla arrives to fight off Titanosaurus. Later, when Ikenos visits Godzilla, he is captured by the aliens. Tied up, Ikenos can only watch as Mifune and the aliens unleash Mechagodzilla 2 and Titanosaurus on Tokyo while Interpol struggles to repair their supersonic wave oscillator and the Japanese armed forces struggle to keep the two monsters at bay. Katsura, while being controlled by Miguel, ignores Ikenos's pleas and controls both the dinosaur and the robot as they destroy the city. Godzilla comes to the rescue, although it is outmatched by the two titans. While Interpol distracts Titanosaurus with the repaired supersonic wave oscillator, Godzilla is able to focus on attacking Mechagodzilla too. Interpol agents infiltrate the alien's hideout, rescue Ikenos, and kill Mifune and many of the aliens. The remaining aliens attempt to escape in their ships, but Godzilla shoots them down with its atomic heat ray. Katsura, while being embraced by Ikenos, shoots herself to destroy Mechagodzilla 2's control device, which had been implanted in her body by the aliens. This helps Godzilla destroy the robot. Godzilla, with the help of the oscillator, defeats Titanosaurus and heads back to sea. Alright. Also on Friday, we will be doing How to Train Your Dragon The Hidden World. Here is the plot in this film. One year after the events of the previous film, Hiccup, Toothless and their fellow dragon riders continue to rescue captured dragons in order to bring them to Burke and its bustling dragon and human utopia. Their efforts have resulted in the island becoming overpopulated with dragons. In a response to the overcrowding, Hiccup desires to find the Hidden World, a safe haven for dragons spoken of by his late father Stoic. Meanwhile, 
a white female fury, held captive by warlords, is given to infamous dragon hunter Grimmel the Grizzly as bait for him to capture Toothless for the warlords use as an alpha. Toothless discovers the white fury, dubbed a light fury by Astrid, in the woods and the two become enchanted with each other until the light fury, sensing Hiccup's nearby presence, becomes frightened and flees. Hiccup and Toughnut later discover Grimmel's dragon traps in the area which were intended to trap Toothless. Grimmel visits Hiccup that night, revealing he has hunted down all the other Night Furies, but Hiccup has prepared an ambush to capture him. Grimmel escapes, burning down Hiccup's house and part of Burke in the process. In response, Hiccup rallies the citizens and dragons to leave Burke on a quest to find the hidden world and safety from dragon hunters. Mid Journey the Burkeans discover an island on which they initially plan to rest for a short while. Seeing Toothless's inability to fly solo hindering his growing relationship with the Light Fury, Hiccup builds an automatic tail for him. In B1, upon receiving the tail, Toothless flies off, meeting the Light Fury on his own and flying with her to an unknown land. Valka, on a scouting patrol, notices Grimmel's approaching army and quickly reports back to Hiccup. Hiccup and the riders head to capture Grimmel, yet, they fall into his trap and barely escape. Roughnut is captured but irritates Grimmel into letting her go, after he realizes he can secretly follow her to the Burkean's new location. Hiccup and Astrid, who are searching for Toothless, find the hidden world and see Toothless and the Light Fury leading the dragons there as a happy couple. When the two humans are discovered and menaced by other dragons, Toothless rescues Hiccup and Astrid and returns them to the Burkeans, with Hiccup realizing that humans would be intruders and unsafe in the hidden world. Suddenly, Grimmel appears and captures Toothless and the Light Fury, who follow Toothless back. Grimmel uses Toothless's alpha status to capture the rest of Burke's dragons by threatening to kill the Light Fury if any dragon or Burkean attacks. With Astrid's encouragement, Hiccup sets out with the Dragon Riders to stop Grimmel and his army. Gliding on wingsuits, they catch Grimmel's army off guard, igniting a battle. Hiccup frees Toothless, but Grimmel drugs the Light Fury into obeying him. Hiccup and Toothless give chase and Hiccup manages to get onto the Light Fury, but Grimmel tranquilizes Toothless in midair, causing the dragon to fall helplessly towards the ocean. Hiccup, realizing he cannot rescue Toothless alone, frees the Light Fury and implores her to save Toothless. He then lets go, causing him and Grimmel to fall towards the water as well. Hiccup loosens his peg leg, causing Grimmel to fall to his death, while the Light Fury unexpectedly grabs Hiccup and brings him to safety. Back on the island, Hiccup realizes that dragons will never be safe in the human world. Hiccup bids a tearful farewell to Toothless and all of the Burkeans set their dragons free to live in the hidden world. Toothless brings all the dragons to his command for one last time as the Light Fury leads them away to their new home. Three months later, Hiccup and Astrid marry on the island on which the Burkeans have settled. Ten years later, Hiccup, Astrid, and their two children sail across the sea, at the edge of the hidden world. It is shown that Toothless and the Light Fury have mated and given birth to three dragon fledglings. After introducing his two children, Hiccup and Astrid take them flying on Toothless and Stormfly, accompanied by the Light Fury and their offspring. Hiccup vows that Burkeans will guard the secret of dragons until humankind can coexist peacefully with each other and dragons can return in peace. Alright. Also on Friday, we will be doing The Upside by Tonari no Kiyakitsuki Sand Girls. Here is the plot in this film. Speeding through New York City in a Ferrari, Del Scott, Kevin Hart, and Philip Lacasse, Brian Cranston, are pulled over by the police. Del convinces the officers that he is rushing Philip to the emergency room, Philip grudgingly plays along, and the two are escorted to the hospital. Six months earlier, the recently paroled Del is ordered to obtain signatures to prove he is seeking a job. He visits various workplaces, including the penthouse home of Philip, a wealthy quadriplegic. Philip, with his assistant Yvon Pendleton, Nicole Kidman, is interviewing candidates for the position of his life auxiliary caregiver. Del barges in and demands a signature for his parole officer. Intrigued, Philip offers him a job, but Del declines. Del visits his ex-wife Letris, 
Ian Naomi King, and son Anthony, Jai Dialo Winston, at their dilapidated apartment, but neither is interested in Dell rejoining their lives. He gives Anthony a book stolen from Philip's library. Desperate to turn his life around, Dell accepts the well-paying position of Philip's live-in caregiver, for which Yvonne establishes a three-strikes rule. Dell is daunted by his new responsibilities, despite guidance from Philip's physical therapist Maggie, Gal Shift Fr and Ani, and box at changing Philip's catheter, earning strike one from Yvonne. Dell learns the book he stole was a gift to Philip from his late wife. Dell informs Latris of his new job and gives her his first paycheck, he asks for the book, but she tells him to do his own dirty work. Yvonne summons Dell back to Philip's home and declares his absence strike three but Philip covers for Dell. Philip's strict do not resuscitate order is put to the test when Dell finds him suffocating and helps him breathe. Dell takes Philip out into the city, where they share a joint to ease Philip's neurogenic pain. Philip reveals that his wife Jenny, Genevieve Angelson, was killed by cancer and he had impaired gliding accident that left him immobile. The pair begin to bond, and discuss Dell's business ideas. Dell adjusts to caring for Philip, even modifying his wheelchair, and is introduced to opera and modern art, he creates his own painting, which Philip displays in the penthouse. Dell suspects that Yvonne has feelings for Philip, but she assures him that Philip is in an epistolary relationship with a woman named Lily Foley, Julia Margulies, they have never met or even spoken, corresponding only through letters. With Dell's encouragement, Philip leaves Lily a voicemail. Philip joins Dell as he takes Anthony out for the day. Everything goes well until Dell asks Anthony for the book back, disappointed in his father, Anthony returns the book and leaves. Dell and Philip return home to a surprise birthday party Yvonne has organized for Philip against his wishes. He and Dell argue, leading to Dell smashing things for Philip's catharsis. Philip socializes at the party, and Dell even gets Yvonne to dance. Carter, Tate Donovan, a neighbor Philip hates, approaches him about Dell's criminal record, but Philip ignores him. Lily calls Philip, and they agree to have dinner. At the restaurant, Philip gives Dell $50,000 for his painting and to start his own business. Lily arrives, and Dell leaves Philip to his date. Lily is quietly overwhelmed, and admits that the situation is not quite what she was expecting. Hurt, Philip returns home, where he lashes out and fires Dell. Time passes, Dell buys Latris and Anthony a new home, and starts a business building motorized wheelchairs. Maggie asks Dell to help Philip, who has gone through several caregivers and refuses to communicate, leading Yvonne to leave. Dell visits the depressed Philip and takes him for a drive, leading to the encounter with police. They flee the hospital and repair their friendship. Dell, having arranged for Philip to go paragliding again, is forced to join. Dell then brings Philip to meet Yvonne, leaving the two of them to reunite as he returns home to Latrice and Anthony. All right. Also on Friday, we will be doing Isn't It Romantic by Kimono Friends Coyote and Greater Roadrunner. Here is the plot in this film. In Australia, during the early 1990s, a young Natalie watches the romantic comedy Pretty Woman during which her mother crushes her spirit and enthusiasm by telling her that women like them did not get happy endings in real life. Twenty-five years later, Natalie is working as an architect in New York City. She has low self-esteem and is treated as a pushover by her colleagues and a new client named Blake, a handsome billionaire, who mistakes her for an assistant during a key meeting. She rebuffs her best friend Josh after he invites her to a karaoke bar and chastises her friend and assistant, Whitney, after catching her watching the romantic comedy The Wedding Singer in the office, cynically ranting about romantic comedies and their cliches. On her way home from the office, Natalie is accosted by a mugger on the subway. After a struggle in which she ultimately repels her attacker, she knocks herself unconscious by clumsily walking headfirst into a steel girder. When Natalie wakes up, she finds herself in her hospital and is greeted by an attractive doctor, who immediately starts flirting with her. Unnerved and confused, Natalie walks outside and notices New York now looks and smells much better than it usually does. She is nearly run over in the street by a limousine, out of which steps an apologetic, genial version of Blake, 
who is now speaking with an Australian accent. Blake drops her off at home and, before leaving, writes his phone number on flower petals, which he then dumps haphazardly into her upturned hat. Still confused, Natalie enters her apartment, which she finds to be much larger and nicer than before. Her previously unruly dog is now well-groomed and obedient, her closet is stocked with a dizzying array of shoes, and her grumpy neighbor Donnie, who mysteriously appears in her apartment, is now behaving flamboyantly, having seemingly become her stereotypical gay best friend. At work, everyone is behaving nicely with her, except for her former assistant, Whitney, who is now her rival. Still flummoxed by all the changes, Natalie goes for a walk with Joshua as they go through the park. Josh helps a choking woman who turns out to be a gorgeous swimsuit model and yoga ambassador named Isabella. There appears to be an instant spark between the two, and they go for a drink together, leaving Natalie alone. As she walks by herself, Natalie notices more strange changes, including ambient sounds that conveniently censor her cursing, and she finally realizes that she's stuck in a PG-13 romantic comedy. Natalie then sets out to undo everything, thinking that if she can recreate the circumstances that led to her being knocked unconscious, she can return to her previous life. She finds the mugger on the subway platform again, but he runs away from her. As she is about to step off the platform into the path of an approaching subway train, she's pulled aside at the last moment by an officer handsome. When she cynically asks if he is saving her life, he replies that he's arresting her for having jumped, and fallen over, the turnstile earlier. At the police station, they will not allow Natalie to use her phone to make her one phone call, and as she has none of her friends or co-workers numbers memorized, she resorts to tossing the petals containing Blake's number into the air, and they fall in the correct order. She calls Blake, who picks her up, and Natalie, thinking that she can enter imprisonment in the wrong com by getting the guy. Blake, accepts Blake's invitation to dinner. Following an off-screen makeover montage with Donnie, Natalie goes on a lovely date with Blake on his yacht, a date which ends with a romantic kiss in the rain in the middle of the street. Much to Natalie's disappointment, they are unable to actually sleep together, due to the PG-13 rating, and Natalie is further distraught when nothing changes after Blake tells her that he loves her. After an awkward encounter between Josh and Blake in her apartment, Natalie and Blake run into Josh and Isabella the next day, and they are invited to Isabella's place in the Hamptons for a party. At the party, Natalie realizes she actually loves Josh just before Josh and Isabella's engagement is announced. After night at a karaoke bar, during which Natalie sings and tries wooing Josh away from Isabella, Natalie wakes up and finds Blake trying to pass off her ideas as his own to his father on the phone. Natalie breaks up with him and runs to stop Josh's wedding. While giving a dramatic speech in the chapel, she realizes that what she really needed all along was not the love of her soulmate, but just to love herself. She leaves the ceremony and steals the couple's wedding car, which is parked outside. Just as she's keen on starting her life anew, she crashes the car into an obstacle and is knocked unconscious. Natalie wakes up in a hospital again and is told by a dirt doctor that she was in an induced coma for 18 hours. She happily discovers that she is back in her reality. With her newly discovered self-esteem, Natalie returns to work and delivers a presentation to Blake, who likes Natalie's pitch. Natalie then apologizes to Josh, he reveals that he's been interested in her all along, and the two kiss. The film ends with a large dance number in the streets of New York with Natalie singing about love. Alright. That's all the home video releases we got. So second, we will be doing MM Monkey Pictures and Roman Cow Productions and Donkey Teeth Company shorts. It's about the storybook of Aladdin 1992. The storyteller tells the story of Aladdin who has been a thief and calls him Street Rat. Alright. That's all the shorts we got. So third, we will be doing Samsung Galaxy S10 e. It's about funny and it makes me laugh so you class can do whatever you want like hitting and doing stuff like it. Alright. That's all I got for today, let's do some work now. Alright, let's do some work now.